Well, good Sunday morning. This is Reverend Phil Anderson of Oakland United Methodist Church in Kansas Avenue United Methodist Church. It is Sunday, October 25th, 2020, and I want to welcome you to an online service today as we are going to be worshiping only online here at www.kaumc.church. And it is a privilege and a pleasure to have you with us today as we are taking the week off from meeting together as we're being a little bit cautious for the rise in coronavirus cases and we certainly want to encourage everyone to be careful to stay cautious and to remember that this is far from being over it appears that we're having a surge in cases here in the Topeka and Shawnee County area and we certainly want to remember Debbie Gasper of Kansas Avenue United Methodist Church, who was worshiping with us both Sunday morning and Sunday night a week ago on October 18th, 2020. And Debbie has since tested positive for COVID-19, was in the hospital overnight on Friday and was supposed to be going home on Saturday. I had a nice visit with her and she wasn't feeling real good, but she said that they were going to give her the needed medication and she was hoping to be able to go home a short time after I visited with her late on Saturday morning. So remember Debbie in your prayers and also anyone else in the church family who might be having health issues of one kind or another. And again, we just felt it was best not to meet today. And just as a quick reason for that, the biggest concern really for a lot of us is the fact that the coronavirus sometimes results in people being asymptomatic in other words not showing any symptoms for this illness the common symptoms are a fever of 100.4 degrees or higher coughing shortness of breath body aches and things of that nature just in general not feeling good and i would certainly suggest people at least call their medical professional if they find themselves not feeling good and wondering what's going on so that they can get some needed attention but again, we didn't want people to maybe have been exposed to the COVID-19 a week ago and then come back into church tomorrow being asymptomatic and yet being a carrier of the coronavirus and then spreading it to others. And then all of a sudden we have 30 or 35 people who have worshiped together and then have all come down and tested positive for COVID-19. So we're at least going to avoid meeting on Sunday, October 25th, and there's a likelihood that we will not meet on Sunday, November 1st as well. So just keep tuned in to our website, www.kaumc.church. I may come up with a couple of special updates this week that will come in very handy, and if so, you'll see the title on them saying update from pastor phil and that's going to be something that's not the normal 10 minute daily devotional that we call fresh bread so if it says update from pastor phil you definitely want to turn on and listen to that because it'll have something that you will probably need to know so again we are coming to you today on our website www.kaumc.church now, at this time, the Kansas Avenue Church is still planning to meet for a business meeting on Tuesday, November the 3rd, 2020, which also is Election Day. The meeting will be at 6 o'clock at Kansas Avenue United Methodist Church, 1029 North Kansas Avenue. And some of the things that are going to be discussed will include topics for the charge conference that's going to be done by Zoom in latter November, I believe the 22nd of November in the afternoon. Again, if you feel uncomfortable about coming to a meeting on Tuesday, November 3rd, and yet you have things that you need to discuss, I would ask that you get a hold of myself and I can direct you to the appropriate person that you would need to talk to about whatever it is you're responsible for so that we still get this meeting done. The reason we need to do it on the 3rd is I believe there's some things due at the Great Plains office, the Topeka Flint Hills District, 
I believe, on November the 5th. So we don't have a lot of time, and we need to get that done. Otherwise, we would probably just forego meeting at least for the 3rd of November. So again, if you can make it to the meeting and you're on one of the boards, please do come. We'll make sure that we keep socially distanced. All of the business meetings we've had really for the last couple of months have really gone well. I believe people have kept their distance and maintained their protocols, including their wearing of masks and keeping their hands washed and clean and not coming if they don't feel well. And really, that's sort of the most important thing I'll leave you with as we get ready for our service is just make sure that if you're not feeling 100%, just don't come. We'll miss you, but you can still hear the sermons and the services at our website, www.kaumc.church. It's not that we don't want you to come. It's just that we don't want you to come if you're not feeling good. And again, if you've been around people, even if you are feeling good, you might want to give it a week off just because you could be asymptomatic and carrying the COVID-19 virus and not know it. And then it gets communicated to someone else. And now they've got it and they go and spread it to others. So it's kind of a vicious circle. We're just trying to take caution. And again, we've done this before. We were certainly letting everyone know a while back, at least on our Fresh Bread Daily devotionals, that we're ready at any time to make adjustments midstream as the case might be and we do really encourage everyone to make sure that they avail themselves of our kaumc.church website so they can stay connected through our services and also that they can stay connected with each other through this medium so we all kind of gather virtually and we're hoping that we can get the ball off the ground real soon for our Zoom broadcast. I know there's a few people who have expressed an interest in Zoom. I've done some tests for it, and it seems to go well. We just need to make sure we have the information for those who have not yet taken part in Zoom on how to do it so that we can give them a step-by-step -step instruction on what they need to do. So... If you do have questions, if you need help setting up a Zoom account, just let me know. I'll try to do the best I can. If not, there's a couple of people who have a lot more expertise on that than I do. And I'm sure that individual would be happy to help you as well. So today is, again, Sunday, October 25th. It's Reformation Sunday. It's also the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. And as we begin our service today, I would ask that you would join me in a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we do come to you today full of thanksgiving for all you do for us, for the great and loving God that you are in our lives, how you've intervened in our lives. You've come into our lives and changed things for the better, Lord. And Father, you said that you would be with us no matter what, that you would never leave us or forsake us. And now today, Lord, I pray your special presence and blessing upon those who are not feeling well. I pray especially today for Debbie Gasper and that you would heal her from this coronavirus, help her to feel better and stronger each day. And Lord, I pray for anyone else in the congregation who's going through health issues that you would be especially near to them at this time. We think also of Kathy Boehning over at Kansas Avenue and Meredith Emmett, who has broken her hip over at Oakland. And Lord, she's in the hospital. We pray for your peace and your healing for each of these individuals. And now, Lord, we give the rest of this time to you. May you bless it. May your word go forth. We pray this now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, let's look at our scripture readings for today, for again, Reformation Sunday, October 25th, 2020, again, the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. Our first scripture lesson comes to us today from Deuteronomy chapter 34, and verses 1 to 12. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, 
all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negeb and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab as the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Poor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. The Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. And we'll talk about that passage here shortly. We now turn to our psalm for today. It's found in Psalm 90 verses 1 to 6 and 13 to 17. One of my favorite psalms, especially the beginning. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they're like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, and in the evening it fades and withers. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Turn now to the New Testament. We'll, lead, we'll look first at our gospel reading today. It comes to us from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer 
nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. And now for our sermon scripture today, it is from the New Testament book of First Thessalonians. It will be from chapter 2 and verses 1 through 8. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel. Even so, we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God, who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with pretext for greed. Nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. And this, dear friends, concludes the reading of our scriptures today. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of today's sermon is Entrusted with the Message. Again, it comes to us from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 8. Today we're going to take a look at the message that God has given to us. But more than given to us, that he has entrusted to us. If I gave a friend perhaps a watch and simply told him that I was giving him this watch, it wouldn't be a big deal what he actually did with the watch, whether he kept it or whether he gave it to someone else or whether he sold it. But if I entrusted him with the watch, it becomes a much more precious gift at that point because I am now giving him something of great worth and value that I want to honor him by giving it to him with the understanding that he would be receptive to that and understanding of the value of this and the great worth of this thing that I'm giving him so much so that he's not going to lose it. He's not going to sell it. He's not going to give it away. He's not going to misplace it, but he's going to really treasure it. And I think that's the way we need to look at the message that God has given to those of us who are believers in Christ Jesus. It's a message that is of great worth. It's a message that is of great value. It's a message, ultimately, that costs God the very life of his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. So we've been entrusted with this message. And Paul here is saying that he has been given this message, but again, more than being given this message, it has been entrusted to him. It's a calling. And many people think, well, the only people that are called are the people who are in ministry. And yet I would suggest to you today that we're all in ministry. If we're believers in Christ, we should all be about serving the Lord in whatever way he directs us to do that. So nobody can really say that they're exonerated or exempt or that they're off the hook when it comes to serving the Lord. We all are called to serve God. 
And so God has entrusted us with this message. You see, God has spoken to each one of us. That's right. He's spoken to you. He's spoken to me. Ultimately, I believe he has spoken to everyone in the world. Now, he's done this in lots of amazing ways. Think of it. God reveals himself to us every day through natural wonders of the world and the universe. The more we know about the intricacies of nature, the more we know there had to be a creator. I've often said that those who believe there was no creative force behind what we see, there was no intelligent designer behind these different things we see. Those people have way more faith than I do because it would be almost mathematically impossible to even conceive of any of this being formed without a divine creator. There's too much order in the world and in the universe. I look at things that are simple, though, that aren't even as complicated maybe as the solar system and the planets. I look at the beautiful sunset that to me is different every night. One of the people I know had a son who was a pilot for the United States Air Force, and this particular person had flown all over the country and around the world. And he said, there's no place that has better sunsets than Kansas. Last Saturday night on October the 17th, I was driving back home from being here at the Oakland United Methodist Church where I'd been preparing for the next day's worship service for quite some time. And I saw a sunset like I had never seen before. It was like a beautiful, glowing, goldish, orangish, yellow medallion just hovering in the sky. And it was just absolutely a marvel to look at. It didn't hurt your eyes to look at like the sunset typically would. And I believe that the reason it looked that way was because we were getting some of the particles from the wildfires out in Colorado that it drifted over into our area of Kansas. And it was filtering through the sunlight and making it so that we could actually really see it, these microscopic particles. Again, the natural wonders of the beauty of God on display for everybody to see. I can't see something like that and not praise God, the creator. You can look at the beautiful fall colors that are ongoing right now in Kansas and praise God for those. That's another miracle of God, how the trees change colors and it can be explained in lots of different ways but ultimately there's a reason why it does what it does and we now have these leaves that are bursting forth in colors of red and gold and orange and yellow so it's a wonderful thing to have nature Re romans 120 says it this way forever since the world was created people have seen the earth and sky think about that and that's true ever since the world was created people have seen the earth and sky Right there, there's evidence that somebody had to have had something to do with putting us right here, right now, right where we are. There's, again, just not enough reason in the world to believe that this could have just haphazardly taken place. And then Romans 120 continues, through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now, what about those people living in other parts of the world, those remote regions where there is no internet, no Facebook, not in, even any Twitter, no TVs, no radios, no books, no newspapers, no magazines, no pamphlets? <laughs> what about those folks? According to the verse that we just read, God has revealed himself to all people through the natural wonders that he created. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. God also reveals himself to us through prayer. 
as we reach out to him, as we draw close to God, he draws close to us. We don't have to be expert at, experts at praying. We don't have to have flowery language. We just talk to God. And you know what? He listens. Psalm 148, 18 says, The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. And finally, the message that we have been entrusted with comes about through God revealing himself through his word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Aren't you glad for the word of God? I mean, I would hate to think of where life would be without the Bible. We are so blessed in the United States of America to be able to have free access to God's Word, the Bible. So many of us take it for granted. We don't even hardly open it during the week. We come to church and we look at the verses up on the screen maybe. And I believe God wants us to get our own Bibles out and to look at them and to use them and to study them, to show ourselves approved. It's a challenge because so many of us are just fighting fatigue all the time. And yet God really blesses us when we get into his word. And the word of God will never come back void. When we read God's word, it's always going to benefit us. Kind of like setting out on a journey and putting gas in your car. You almost have to make sure that your tank is full if you're going to go very far. And I believe that's our case spiritually. If we don't have the word of God in us, we're not going to make it very far. We can go up to a certain point, but we're not going to get to where we need to go. It's going to be very difficult to go very far on an empty tank. And we fill up our spiritual tank with the word of God. God also reveals himself to us through divine revelation and through the Holy Spirit. You see, once we have received Christ into our lives, then we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to us in all different kinds of ways, but I believe in particular, He will reveal things to us through just everyday experiences and the insights that He gives us. The revelations that come to us, maybe in the middle of an activity, but He'll tell us what He needs us to know and it could be something that's vitally important to us and we have to act upon it. I believe, again, if we're walking with Christ, we're going to know when that voice that we're hearing is from the Holy Spirit. And when it is, we need to do exactly what he tells us to do. That voice comes to us directly through God. It's not necessarily going to be an audible voice where we can hear it, but it's nonetheless just as much of a voice because it's something that God is giving to us to communicate with us exactly what he wants us to know. Matthew 16, 13 to 17 tells of the declaration that Peter made about Jesus. And I really like this particular section of scripture. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say, uh, who, do, do, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Again, direct revelation, because Peter began to know who Jesus was, and then God revealed himself and through Jesus to Peter. And so the more we get close to Jesus, the more God is going to share his revelation with us. And we just have to be receptive to that. 
And that's that still small voice that God uses to tell us what he wants us to do, where he wants us to go, maybe what he wants us to say. It's just a wonderful thing to be able to be led by the Spirit. You know, the Bible says if we walk in the Spirit, then we won't be gratifying the desires of the flesh. If we're not walking in the Spirit, that means if we have one foot in the world and one foot trying to serve the Lord, then we're going to be all over the place and we're not going to be walking in obedience to God because, well, our heart is not completely devoted to the Lord. So we have to take this message that we've been entrusted with and to really make it our own, to integrate it into every aspect of our life and to let God work that message through us completely so that we are able then to take that message and make it the most important part of our life. So we've been entrusted with this message. Most of all, God has revealed himself to us and entrusted to us his word through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The spotless, sinless son of God who came into our world because of his great love for us so that we could be set free from our sins and have eternal life with him. John 14, 6 and 7 records this interaction between Jesus and his disciples. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he says these words, If you had known me, you would know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father am one. God has entrusted us with the message of Jesus Christ. It's a message that may be increasingly unpopular in our world today. There's hostility toward Christians. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things that may not be so complimentary to Christ's followers. And yet, we're called to say exactly what God tells us to say. In Galatians, Paul talks about making sure that we're not seeking the approval of humans when we share the word of God, but that we are honoring God by being obedient to him and by saying what he has told us to say or doing what he's told us to do. Friends, we have to take a stand at some point. We can't keep letting the world push us around or move us into a corner or make us to have no effect. I believe that's one of the things that's happened to the church overall is in, a, in the United States of America, we've kind of abdicated our role in being leaders in our culture and in our society because we've oftentimes been put on the defensive by the world and we've not been able to stand up and give a defense to our faith, to stand up and give people a reason for what we believe. And consequently, rather than getting into some type of a confrontation or discussion, we just retreat and we lose that much more ground to the point now that church for a lot of people is just irrelevant. I was talking to a friend a week ago, and I told him that I'm not even sure 10% of the Topeka population goes to church anymore. You may say it's that much or more. I'm not sure. Not on my block, and I'm not judging anybody, but I'm not seeing it. I walk around town. I sometimes take walks through the neighborhood before church. I'm not seeing many people going to church anymore. Somehow or another, we've lost that. And yet, in spite of that, the needs of our society are greater than ever. Have you noticed? I mean, people are so desperate. They're so angry. They're so upset. They're so disillusioned. And friends, we have the answer for them. If we could just introduce them to Jesus Christ, to share Christ's love with them in real practical ways, so that then we would have earned the right to be heard by those folks. And then when we do have the opportunity, we tell them about Jesus.
I was thinking of the story the other day about a couple of pastors who were standing on a corner in a major city where there's a bit of a hill and as people do sometimes, they were holding up large signs and their signs read that the end is near. And you know how people are when they see signs like that. They kind of shrug and give a smug grin or a little bit of a sneer and they just drove right on by it and they heard one crash after another and it's, people continue to go by and sneer at them. They would disappear over the hill and hear another crash. And this kept going for quite some time and finally one of the pastors turned to the other and said, do you think we should just put up a sign that says the bridge is out? Well, sometimes I believe that's our message for people is we want them to know that there is going to be a day of reckoning and we want it to be able to express it in a way that it isn't going to be a turnoff to them, but it's going to lead them into that relationship with Christ. That message that we've been entrusted with is desperately needed, but it starts with me. One of the reasons I believe that things have kind of gotten to where they have in our society is that the church has almost always been pointing their fingers at somebody else outside the walls and beyond the stained glass windows, and they're trying to say how much they need the Lord, when in fact we need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need that relationship with Jesus Christ. I've got to start it myself. My old friend Gerald used to say this, and it's just so hard to argue with it. You cannot give away that which you do not have. I have a book here on my desk called Comeback Churches that was written about a decade ago. And it talks about churches that were in decline with their membership and just their ministries overall and how some of these churches saw dramatic turnarounds. And I thought, gee, that sounds great. I was even thinking at one point in September of assembling what I was going to call the dream team at both the Kansas Avenue United Methodist Church and the Oakland United Methodist Church here in Topeka and see if we could get some of the members here who really had a vision for things that these churches could do and put our ideas together and see what happened. But, you know, in reading this book, it was pretty obvious that while that is not a bad idea, and hopefully we will have times where people can come together, especially once this pandemic lifts a little bit, amen? But I could call people on the phone and get ideas. We could do it in a variety of ways. But in reading this book, one of the very first things that it says is that the leader, which in most cases is the pastor of the church, and in this case, it would be me, has to lead by example. And the first thing that the pastor must do is to seek the Lord in prayer. Not just a two-minute prayer. It may be a two-month prayer. And I believe that's what God is calling me to do. And I'm hoping that that will be my biggest priority in our ministries going forward in these next few months. So that maybe by the time we turn the calendar from 2020 to 2021, I will have had ample opportunity to do my prayers, to seek the Lord, to seek his guidance, to seek the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in my life so that I am now given a clear direction on what we can do, what we may not want to do. And then that we can come together and collaborate. And then that the others that would come together can also be more intentional in their praying. 
so much I want to share with you about this, but right now, the most important thing for me to say is I need to be about this business of praying. And so until I do that, I'm not going to be sharing a whole lot of my ideas or visions because I want to make sure it goes through the proper channels. And the first priority isn't getting people together and having some coffee on a Saturday morning and talking about our dreams and our visions for the churches, but rather it's for me to make sure that I'm prayed up. And then I put in that time with the Lord. So I need this message. I need to be able to articulate this message and to communicate it in my home to my family. Some of the di most difficult times I think that we share our faith is uh, the occasions where we are with our families because they know us so well. They have seen our failures. They've seen our flaws. They've seen our foibles. And we look at ourselves in that light and we feel like we don't have a leg to stand on to share our faith. And that's why it's so vitally important that we realize that it has nothing to do with our performance or what we've done or what we haven't done. It's all about the grace of God through Jesus Christ on that cross. And I go back to that every time now because I believe that's what the devil does for a lot of people is that he reminds them of their failures and their faults and he then puts up the roadblocks on those people and prevents them from doing the ministry that they need to be doing, especially in their families, because he makes them feel like they've been disqualified as individuals from sharing about the Lord. Now, I don't believe we need to air out all of our sins in front of everybody in the world. I mean, if we did, we'd probably be here all night and then some. What I do think we need to do is just own up to the fact that we've all made mistakes. Romans 3.23 says that best for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes and yet we now have received the forgiveness of God that comes to us through Christ Jesus As Romans says, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to be good enough for him. We didn't have to clean up our act. He just loved us that much that he came and died for us. So the message we share with our families, we shouldn't let our past stop us from talking about the Lord to our spouse, to our parents, to our siblings, to our children, to our relatives. And then we share that message with those in the church. That should be the easiest place to share it is here in church. But that should just be where we build each other up. I'm not going to say it doesn't count. It, it counts as far as sharing our faith. But we then need to move it outside the church walls. And that's where the rubber meets the road when we begin to share our faith in Christ with our neighbors those with whom we come into contact, wherever that might be, whether it's someone that lives on our block or someone that we see at work or someone that we've known in the past we might see at a store or it may just be someone we happen to meet on a one-time basis. Are we ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others? I believe we should always be ready to share that good news. It's a message that we've been entrusted with and that God's expecting us to treasure and to use the way he intended it to be used. And that is to bring people closer to him. I always say if I can do one thing as to point people to Jesus Christ, I'll feel like I have done exactly what I believe God wants me to do. I can point people to Christ and then I need to get out of the way. If God's going to use me to help introduce them to Christ. Again, it's a between them and the Lord. I'm just there to facilitate. I don't save anybody. You don't save anybody. 
So we don't need to put all that pressure on ourselves. Let the Lord do the work. We simply are obedient to him and do what he tells us to do and we say what he tells us to say. The message is needed here in Topeka, Kansas, desperately. A lot of hurting people in Topeka, in the state of Kansas, in the United States and around the world. It is easy to become overwhelmed when we realize the magnitude of the needs and how widespread this message needs to go. This message we've been entrusted with. Sometimes we think we're the only ones who are going to be sending out this message and it's all of, up to us and it's easy to just sort of get so overwhelmed by everything we just don't do anything. And yet I was watching a television program this morning on the Word Network and it showed Christians around the world, in Africa, in Ukraine, in... New Zealand, in Europe, in Haiti, and in the United States, all over the globe, sharing about Jesus Christ as they were preaching out on street corners. The Word of God was going forth. We're not the only ones who have the Word of God. We are among many people who have been entrusted with this message. Don't back down. Don't retreat. Don't avoid talking about your faith because you're concerned you might offend somebody or make them uncomfortable. I think the bigger issue is don't be uncomfortable yourself talking about your faith. Just relax and talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, like you would talk about the weather or your favorite sports team or a good place to go get a bite to eat or the best place in town to buy produce. I mean, we can share our faith in Christ that naturally. We just have to get used to doing that. And I believe God will honor us as we do just that. One of the keys, friends, is to develop relationships with people. It may take weeks, months, and even years to develop a relationship where someone is going to give you the time and show you the interest in hearing about Christ. It's been said that no one really cares how much you know until they know how much you care. We show people that we care by investing our time and our energy in them. Many of us are just, again, too tired to invest much in, too much energy in other people. We've had it with people almost the most. We're just saying, you know, a good day for me is when I can just stay home and not hear from anybody. God wants us to invest in other people's lives. Jesus Christ invested himself in us. He expects no less from us to do the same for others. Showering people with the goodness and the grace of God through Jesus Christ. In our lesson today from 1 Thessalonians, Paul's reminding his fellow believers how he and others have gone out with who had gone out with him had encountered great opposition because of their faith. I want to tell you friends that when you share your faith, you may be ridiculed, you may be made fun of, you may be turned off, you may lose friends. Even if you do it in a loving and compassionate way. Yet great is your reward in heaven. Remember Jesus said, if the world hates me, the world's going to hate you. Don't expect people 
to roll out the red carpet for you when you want to talk about Jesus. And yet, we can do it in a way that's winsome. I like that word winsome because it is kind of the, our ultimate goal. It is to win some to Christ. So much of it is how we communicate our message that we've been entrusted with. If we do it in love, if we do it in sincerity, if we show others the grace of God that Christ has shown us, I believe a lot of people will listen. And a lot of what that message is has to do with our life. Remember that for many people, you will be the only Bible that they will ever read. It's going to be your life that says so much. If your words and your actions don't line up, then it's all for naught. So we need to be totally 100% sold out to Jesus Christ and live fully for him every day, not just on Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, every day of the week, we strive to live for Christ. We try to be obedient to Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, not to earn our salvation. That was already paid for by Jesus, but it's to show the Lord how much we love Him and that we are submitting to Him. He's our Master and we're submitting to Him. In spite of the great opposition that Paul and his fellow ministers had received, they never backed down. In fact, their commitment to Christ is even stronger. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, Paul says that just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God. Who are you trying to please? That's always a good question. Are you doing something to please another person? Or are you doing it to please God? Paul adds that he and those with him never sought the flattery or praise of man, but that they held true to the message of salvation coming through Jesus Christ. We all need examples of those who have stood strong and who have shown us what it really means to communicate the love of God. Jesus Christ is our ultimate example. You know, he endured the cross for our salvation. He went all the way to that terrible, agonizing, painful death out of his great love for us. At the end of today's text, Paul takes it a step further, saying that he and those who are with him in the ministry did not just preach the word of God, but that they showed others the love of God by their own lives because he said, you have become very dear to us. So not just pre preaching the message and shutting the door and saying, see you next time we have church, but they gave of their lives to other people. Looking at today's gospel message in Matthew 22, Jesus is having a discussion with the Pharisees. One of the lawyers asked Jesus a question kind of to test him or to trap him. And that question was, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus wastes no time because for him it's a very simple answer because he always put the first things first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first commandment. And then Jesus said, the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, if you do those two things, you don't have to be concerned about the rest of the laws and the Ten Commandments and everything else that God has shown us that he expects of his people. Because we will honor the Lord. And we won't live in that rebellion and that disobedience. 
Friends, when we keep things in perspective, when we keep God first and we strive to be imitators of Christ, when we really love others the way Christ loved us, God's message will go forth. It can't help but be communicated by us. And people will see it and people will hear it. And lives will be changed, not so much because of us, but because of what Christ is doing through us. As we look at the lectionary today, Deuteronomy speaks of Moses going up to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, where the Lord showed him the whole land that he had led the children of Israel to enter. God told Moses, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. And then he tells Moses, I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. The consequence Moses faced for disobeying God, remember? When he struck the rock and God told him just to speak to it. God loves us, but there's sometimes there are going to be consequences for what we've done. And yet God will use those even to bring us closer to him. Interesting that Moses died there in the land of Moab. It says Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. In other words, Moses was finished with his responsibilities and it was time for him to enter his eternal rest. No one knows where he was buried to this day. There was no shrine made to Moses, no statue, no tomb that people came by in caravans to see where Moses was buried. None of that. No one knows where he was buried. He was 120 years old at the time that he died. His sight it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 34, was unimpaired. His vigor had not abated. He was in great shape. It was just time for him to go. He had done what God had told him to do. You see, it's never about us as servants of God. It's about what God does through us. God uses us to do what he needs us to do. And then he calls us home when we're done. When our mission is done, God will let us know. Until then, we need to keep serving him. If you're still alive and breathing, God has a purpose for you. Let me say that to anybody listening. I don't care how old or how young you are. God has a purpose and a plan for you. He is not done with you yet. Amen. If nothing else, friend, you can pray. You can pray for me to start with. I need prayers all the time. That God will continue to lead my life and to direct me into the past where he wants me to go to be obedient to him. Not to get frustrated when things don't always go my way. Not to get overcome by fatigue and all the things that are required of me sometimes, but just to stay focused on him. You can always pray for me in that way, to pray for strength for me, pray for me in my relationship with my family, my wife, and all those around me so that I am going to be a godly example to them. But that that godly example isn't a show, it's not a sham, it's not a front, but it's the real deal. It comes from within. It's a wellspring that comes out. So I want God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ to be so alive inside of me that it can't help but bubble out and just overflow. And that's then where I'm going to be able to share it with everyone else. 
And again, when you do that in freedom, there's no fear of rejection because God has accepted us. Why would we be concerned about someone else rejecting us? It says something here that I really wanted to share with you here on Deuteronomy because I think it has to do with Moses, who we spent quite a bit of time talking about these past few weeks in our sermon series called Through the Wilderness. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. There was never anybody, I don't believe, this side of eternity who was closer to God as a human being, as a mere man, than was Moses. How many times Moses went up and talked to God on a one-on-one -on -one basis to the point where Moses even had the audacity to ask God if he could see his glory. Remember, I believe it was in Exodus chapter 34 where God said, no, I will go by you. I'm going to cover you up as you're in the cleft of the rock so you can't see my face. Because if you see my face, you're going to die. But you can see me from the back after I pass by. They had that type of a bond, that type of a relationship. Moses was the only person that's ever seen any element of God. Amazing. Just mind-blowing. Sends a chill up my spine. He was unequaled, Moses was, in all the signs and wonders that the Lord had sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. And for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. There's never been anybody like Moses, and there never will be again. That's what that's saying. Jesus Christ comes into our world and does greater things than Moses because Jesus Christ comes now into the world with this message that had been entrusted to Moses by God. And now here comes Jesus Christ into the world revealing the very nature of God in his own person. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The message is that God so loved the world, John 3, 16 says it best, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's a free gift open to anybody and everybody. Jesus Christ shows us the message because he is the message. John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have been entrusted with a message. The message is the Word of God, and Jesus Christ is that living Word of God. We've been entrusted with Jesus. That's the message that we have been entrusted with. And now we must use the opportunities that God gives us to share that message with others. We do that when we share Jesus Christ with everyone we meet, showing them the love, the kindness, the forgiveness, and the grace that we have been freely given. Amen. Let us conclude this service in a word of prayer. Father, again, I 
Thank you that we can come together through this medium of KAUMC.church. Lord, I pray for those today who once again find themselves maybe staying at home on Sunday after being back together for a period of about four months. Lord, now it looks like we're shutting down again. We're not for sure when we're going to reopen. We hope it's soon, but we really don't know. But Lord, as we have said before, as we go through this wilderness journey, there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. And Lord, it is easy for us to get discouraged. It's easy for us to lose heart. And yet, Lord, you are with us, even in those times of despair. Lord, you don't want us to stay in that condition, however. Lord, you want to lift us up. And Lord, to help us to overcome those obstacles that seem to be so big in front of us, Lord, that those giants that are in our lives, Lord, you can handle. And Lord, when we put our faith in you, Lord, we are now not subject to those giants, but we are now overcomers. And Father, I ask your blessing now upon each one listening to this service, whether they're from Kansas Avenue or Oakland Church, or whether they're from some other church, or just people listening in and stumbling upon this. Lord, we welcome them. Lord, may each of us receive Jesus Christ the living word of God, the message of God who came to us in human form, embodying <laughs> the goodness of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, and the love of God. And so that now, Lord, we experience that. And Lord, it's too good to keep to ourselves. Lord, just help us by our words and our actions to share the love of Christ with everyone we meet. Lord, I now ask your blessing as we conclude this service today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And I pray this today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, I do thank you so much for spending this time with me today here as we've done this online sermon. My prayer is that you will have a great week, that you will stay connected with the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I do invite you to tune in to our daily devotionals. I think now more than ever, it's important that we do that. It's just a little way for us to stay connected. And that is, again, a 10-minute devotional we do every Monday through Saturday. We do the sermons online on Sunday. They're all found at kaumc.church. If you are listening to those and you are getting anything out of them, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I would like you to call three people up today and tell them that they need to start listening to this because it's a resource. I believe that it's a great way for us to stay connected. I don't want people to feel like we're going to just drop off the map. And we don't know how long we're going to be out of church in terms of in-person services. It may just be for one week. It may be for several weeks. We don't know. But I don't want people to feel like we have forgotten them and that we have forsaken them. Let them know you're thinking of them. Let them know you're praying for them. And let them know you love them. I'll do the same. And let's just reach out and help carry each other's burdens at this time. And let's encourage one another to stay focused on Jesus Christ, knowing that he is with us and he is not going to leave us. Folks, have a great rest of your Sunday. I hope to see you back tomorrow at kaumc.church for fresh bread. Until then, may God richly bless you. Is my prayer. Once again, this is Reverend Phil Anderson. Thank you for joining me. And now I wish you all a very good day. God bless you.